He's a gentleman, but actually mainly gentlemen. I looked at my channel stats today and it's like 88% male audience. That's what YouTube says. So mainly gentlemen, welcome back to today's Monday update. It's the 18th of March. I cannot believe we are multiple percentages through the year already. It feels like New Year was like a couple weeks back. Well, it kind of does, but it kind of doesn't. But anyway, let's get into the video. It's going to be a slightly different format today. The past few weeks, I started off with a business model that I tried and gave some key lessons, some key tips from TikTok organic dropshipping to TikTok shop to TikTok affiliate to faceless YouTube channels. All things that I've been trying, tried or yeah, trying or tried that there's only two things to say about that. So rather than talk about a business model, I've kind of exhausted them for now. And I'd, I don't want to just force value and talk about something I'm not doing. I only want to bring an authentic, genuine side to this channel and give you updates and my thoughts based on experience, not just based on a newsletter or an article I've read. With that in mind, I also need to get out of this book right here, which I'll be talking about soon because I it's blowing me away and i spoke about a little bit of it last week and i believe some real value can be communicated through you based on what's resonated with me and i've even saved the page number on my hand i read it last night and i keep my phone and laptop out of the room so i was like i need to find a way to remember that i want to talk about this tomorrow so i wrote it on my hand there we go so let's get into it. I want to first talk about the power of copying. And this is what I wrote. Never steal, but copy always if you can. And th these words are a bit unusual coming out of my mouth because all my life I've been, I've prided myself in being a little bit different, thinking a bit different. I would never felt that I fit into like one group of people or I just had one hobby. I liked athletics. I liked ping pong. I liked football. Um, I was part of the church community, but then I was also part of the, I guess, more sp sporty community. But then I did YouTube and streaming and FIFA and there was just lots of different kind of elements. And I never pigeonholed myself into one category and I never wanted to just identify with this is who I am because I always felt that I had such varied interests and passions. That was not me. So copying was like a, oh, no, no. Or an, another example, I'd be writing my, I don't know, work at school and the way I'd be covering up my work because I didn't want other people to copy me. I know that's a bit different, but I just had a thing about copying. But what I'm realizing time and time and time again, copying is so useful in business. It is so useful. Steve Jobs himself, copied other people's ideas, but brought his passion for product design and beauty and innovation and simplicity to the forefront and really gave the customers what they wanted. So if that's not a reason to kind of convince you to think about comp copying and not reinventing the wheel, I don't know what is. Another stat that's really played on my mind recently, it was spoken about in the Sidemen documentary and there was like a a YouTube analyst, I presume that's a job these days, but there was um, a lady on there that said, for every uh, minute on YouTube alone, 10,000 plus minutes are uploaded. And that really stuck with me because I thought in terms of my own content, in terms of my own channel, for every minute you're watching of this video, so I am four minutes deep right now, so I've already, these four minutes have competed with over 40,000 minutes of content of other people's channels. And it was just a massive food for thought. And I'm saying all of that to say that competition is so high, particularly in the online business world, because these, a lot of these business models are accessible to everyone, which is great, but it also means that you have a heck of a lot of competition and you've got to really find the key players in the niche and you've really got to copy them, try and improve on them and copying them will streamline your way to success. Don't just download the videos, re-upload them and steal the content, but you've really got to think smart, copy, but not steal. So that is my thoughts on copying. 
I guess the last example I can give with TikTok organic drop shipping, so many course providers and experts in that field say, in order for you to test a product or to find a product, you need to find an unsaturated product. So I don't know, this spray bulb might be unsaturated. You've got to have proof that it will go viral. So you've got to find a count that's just trending. Perhaps it's recent so that other people aren't also ordering the product to try and test it. And then you've got to copy the video as closely as possible to the competitor. You don't just download it and re-upload it, but you copy it exactly. The camera angles, the text, the sound they've used, the caption. You're copying every single element to maximize your success. Let other people do the hard work. This is what I'm saying. Let other people do the hard work. When competition is so high, don't be afraid to copy. So whatever niche you're in, whatever business you're exploring right now, think of or first off, find out who the key players are. Do a lot of work in the research and copy other people as closely as you can because that will save you a lot of pain. And there's a reason why people are successful and there's a reason why people are making a lot of money because their blueprint that they found works. So copy that in your own way. I am going to take a drink now because I'm getting a little bit of a sore throat. Right. Also, you will if you, this is your first time on the channel, you'll realise that my videos are very just one record. This is authentic. This is genuine. Just raw is the word I'm thinking of. Next, moving on to this book. Key value right here. And it just it's incredible psychology of money i'm not sponsored it's not an ad it's not affiliate you can you can check it out I'm, i could chuck a link in my description for you to buy it yourself on amazon but just i don't know morgan owls or psychology of money there you go bless yourself so i want to go on and talk about something that has been defined in this book as tail events and let me, I've underlined a specific passage. It kind of hurts me underlining in books, but I also think that if, if it's a really good book and it's something I'm going to read over and over again, it's good to let certain bits stick to me and be called out to me. So, a tail event is anything that is huge, profitable, anything that is huge, profitable, famous or influential is the result of a tail event. And outlying one in thousands or millions event. And most of our attention goes to things that are huge, profitable, famous, or influential. So it's basically saying most of our attention goes towards the results of tail events. When most of what we pay attention to is the result of a tail, it's easy to underestimate how rare and powerful they are. <sighs> The best way I can I can kind of describe it is by using examples. So, for example, Disney, Walt Disney, the whole kind of Disney empire. It wasn't doing too well. Um, where are we looking? Like 1930s, 1938. That is when things took off. Uh, through Snow White, 83 minutes that produced the tail event that gave Disney the recognition and the kind of the platform that they now have. That one film, you may think that everything they produced from then on, they had over, where does it say here, 400 cartoons. Nothing had taken off. Things were looking pretty desperate. Things were looking pretty dire. And then all of a sudden, it was that one cartoon, Snow White. And I'm saying all this to say that very, very, very frequently in business, those that have succeeded or are doing incredibly well have had one tail event that has brought in the majority of the kind of success. And that's what is attributed to. So Mr. Beast, for example, might be an outlier because every one of his videos gets 100 million plus views. However, there was one or two videos that was the tail event to produce that success. Airac, if you're familiar with him, his tail event was doing a whole couch series with Logan Paul. He bought Logan Paul's couch for, was it like $13,000? And then like skydive with it and did crazy things with it. 
used someone else's platform to grow himself. Another example here is a art collector called Bergruen. And I believe he was German, but it was basically saying that he became one of the most successful art collectors in the world, not because he had like some type of genius for selecting amazing art pieces, but because he consistently bought tons and tons and tons of collections. 99% of what he owned was worth nothing. But the 1%, he had Picassos. He had, I'm not a, a massive like art guy. So if I don't get, uh, he had like Monet's and Matisse's and Brack's, if that's the thing. His collection was worth over like a billion dollars. But he was no one really that special. He just had time in that niche and he spread himself to maximize the outcome of a tail event. It also goes on to talk about angel investors and different ETFs. An ETF is like a collection of companies you can invest in. For example, the S&P 500. If you invest in that, it's a collection of like America's biggest 500 companies. And the idea is if you invest in that, you own a tiny slither of each of these 500 companies. And over time, it's proven to, on average, go up between, I think, 7 and 12%. So over time, it's kind of consistent gains and you're just betting on all of them winning. But when you go into the actual um, results of what's driven the ETF to kind of grow in, in value, at, often at times it's the result of five, six, maybe 10 businesses going crazy during that period, which has offset the majority of businesses, which have slumped a little bit. In this book, it gives the example of um, Apple and Amazon. And it, say, it says, I think it was 2020, I might be a little bit out, it might be 2017, the, those two numbers come to my mind. But it basically says that during one year, those two companies attributed to 13% of the overall S&P 500, 500 companies growth. That whole ETF was controlled, 13% of the growth was controlled by two companies. And within those companies themselves, for example, Amazon, it invents hundreds of products. A massive kind of laughing product people or failure that Amazon had was the Fire Phone. And they invested loads into the production of that phone. And it flopped. But Amazon, because they'd invested so much in, in so many different areas, they had Amazon Web Services. And what else did they have? Maybe like Audible, like successful acquisitions, Ring Door. But do you know what I mean? Like, I need to slow down my talking now. I'm saying, do you know what I mean? I'm not even finishing my own words. Because they ha had spread themselves so successfully and because the, the tail events or where they had spread themselves, if the thing that they focused on had done well, the power that that would have to lift the rest of the failures and mean that they meant kind of nothing or they were inconsequential was insane. So... I'm speaking of all these big businesses and you might feel a bit like, how does this kind of apply to me? But it's it's thinking of how I can copy other people to maximize my chance of a tail event happening, but then also how is the area I'm focusing on, is that tail event big enough to more than offset all the other failures? So I have identified myself several times in here as the failing entrepreneur. I believe when I'm highly successful as valued in terms of money down the line, I'll still be the failing entrepreneur because the whole thing with me is I want to fail time and time and time again to maximize the outcome of a tail event happening in my life. And that's exactly what Amazon did with the Fire Phone. They failed. Um, there's a there's a famous story of Netflix CEO, I don't know if it's the current one or what, but essentially he said to them, guys, our hit rate is too high. So they cut a number of like really high budget, almost guaranteed success films to increase their risk of failure so that when one of those tail events came along, it would more than outperform one of those guaranteed kind of hit films. So some people might define it as having a appetite for failure or having a failure rate that you have to hit in order to show that you're innovating and taking enough risks. And some people just say, 
it, it's it's about maximizing your chance for for tail events so that's where copying comes hand in hand with uh, tail events and maximizing your success i wrote here that although failure rate is high those that have done incredibly well consistently expose themselves to opportunities knowing that if just one takes off it takes care of the rest that's the best way i can describe it and hopefully that inspires you in whatever you're doing to think okay if this takes off what could be the outcome of it obviously you don't just flip in now buy a load of lottery tickets because if that takes off it could change my life it's thinking in business okay cool if this takes off what could be the outcome and this leads on nicely to my updates um the biggest update is me actually admitting or not admitting my failure but as a result of analyzing everything i was doing i'm chastising or cutting off some some activities in order for me to focus on those businesses or the activities that could produce the most likely outcome of doing very well so for example the faceless youtube channel i've said i'm not doing this anymore because the competition had gotten so high since i started it six seven months ago and i realized when i get monetized it's not going to be income producing asset for such a long time and I want to focus on things that are going to be income producing that when that tail event comes it can be life changing transformational and yes I know a YouTube channel can be all it takes is one video to go crazy but when the competition is that high and I don't believe I'm reinventing um, the niche or leading it in any way shape or form I knew Deep down, despite having gained over a thousand subscribers in six months and having 50,000 plus views, it was just going to be a slow burner forever because competition was so, so high. So I thought, this isn't, this isn't worth it for me. The likelihood of a tail event is really low, especially when I'm not able to compete at the level of the, the main guys that are driving 90% of the growth in this niche area. So... We cut it off. Next, in terms of updates, TikTok affiliates, okay? I've made a video about this, how some people are making 60,000 pounds or dollars plus in a month of revenue. Sorry, in profit. That in terms of the sales revenue they're driving, it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars and their take home is tens of thousands of dollars. And that's why I cannot give up on TikTok affiliates. I slowed down a little last week, but I put in some time to really rethink my strategies because the products that I was promoting or trying to get affiliate income from were, had already gone viral. So I was, the competition was too high. There's a theme here. I'm, I'm thinking about what is the competition like? Am I really trying so hard? To run an uphill battle when so many other people are doing the same thing so it's particularly in tiktok affiliates i'm thinking okay tiktok is only going to promote the videos that are converting and if i'm convert if i'm competing sorry with a thousand other people that are all trying to sell this product because it's gone viral then it's probably not the best outcome for me particularly whilst my tiktok account doesn't have hundreds of thousands of followers and i don't get that head start in terms of video views and sales in order for my for my own product videos to go viral next tiktok shop sorry if you can hear a siren in the background tiktok shop is a constant burner i'm constantly just every day spending an hour or so um uploading new products to the store um creating tiktok videos and we're gradually building a little bit of momentum it's not been successful so far i am happy to let it tick over Although I am aware I could probably pivot in terms of my product and what I'm selling and test something that's more likely to go viral, test a product that creators would actually love to promote themselves rather than the, the products I'm testing are like um, art prints for the wall. And even if I send a sample to a creator, they still have to buy a frame or they still have to like put it onto their wall at the very least in order to promote it. So I think I need to pivot a little bit in that area 
but I'm almost happy enough with it ticking over. But whilst I'm speaking right now, I know that's not the right attitude. That's not going to get me success. That's just going to get me mediocre results. So I I need to pivot in that area. And but I've got to give you an update of that. I'm still doing it. It's still ongoing. Also, uh, working with the property developers has got off to a good start. I'm helping them with content to try and grow the community and start my property investment journey myself too, which I will keep you guys updated on for sure, 100%. And it's a really interesting process because I'm working with two other indiv individuals and we've just been kind of defining roles, defining business goals sorting out teething issues, but I am genuinely excited for growth. I'm excited for the impact it will have and how we can help so many other people through the mentorship and the business. Last thing is I did secure a part-time role. I've not had a specific contracted hour role for a year and a half. I've just been doing agency work or freelance work or like Amazon Flex or dog walking, that kind of more side hustle flexible work for the past year and a half on and off but from easter time just to give that financial security and that financial backbone whilst i'm growing everything else that's something i'll be taking on after the easter break so i guess we're going into april then so in my head i kind of have a few weeks now to really make the most of this full time um it would be amazing if the next week's the results of the next weeks could give me that tail event that means I don't actually have to start this part-time role but we'll keep trying we'll keep moving we'll keep going and yeah in terms of like defined updates and what's going on that is it the, every video on a Monday I just want to give updates I want to give thoughts and feelings and any value that I believe so at the beginning today we gave a slightly different format but I really enjoyed kind of talking about this book. Although it was a little bit messy and not edited and uh, semi-scripted, I hope it gave you some value. Um, I never really ask for likes or comments, but if you've watched this and you think, okay, I got some value from it, it'll be helpful to me to understand. I can obviously see it in terms of retention and in the stats, whether you liked it, because I can see whether you continued watching the video, etc but a like would be helpful just to understand if this has been good and helpful. All right then, well, that has been me. My throat <laughs> is going, my voice is going, so I'm gonna stop. Have a fantastic week. Make sure to follow my journey on the Instagram because we do more or less daily updates on there and provide further value to kind of help you. And also just connect with me. Like if you're on this journey and you're following these videos, and you just want someone to connect with in this space, we can support one another. Drop me a message, let's reach out and maximize our chances of tail events happening. Come on, don't steal, but copy. I don't know why I said that, but anyway, I'm waffling. Take care, don't steal, but copy. Maximize your chances of a tail event happening. That's where I was going with it and have a great week.